gente hacia un propósito común que lleve a la sociedad a un nivel superior. Y dice que en tiempos de crisis, en tiempos de cambio, en tiempos de conflicto, es cuando más importante se hace esta cualidad y más oportunidades se abren a los líderes para movilizar a la sociedad hacia estadios superiores y mejores. En México estamos viviendo una época de cambio en donde hay una polarización clara de la sociedad. Una gran parte de la sociedad, queramos o no queramos, apoya el cambio y las políticas de la, de, de, del gobierno actual. Y otra gran parte de, 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 pues se opone, critica y está totalmente apuesto a esas políticas. Es una polarización que de una u otra manera hay que terminar y hay que tender puentes. We need to build bridges to solve this conflict. Porque de otra manera el país se nos va a escapar. Esa es la función de ANEI. La función de ANEI es crear puentes, es buscar la forma de movilizar a toda la sociedad, especialmente a los empresarios independientes, hacia objetivos que lleven a México a un nivel superior. Eh, por eso es uh, la contribución de Michael is very important, since uh, he will he has that position, he has that. Um, that uh, thinking and uh, I'm, I'm sure that we will enjoy very much his, his, uh, this uh, talk with him. Thank you, Mike, for coming, Michael, and um, we, we are ready to, for your words. Thank you very much. Michael, the camera is all yours, so welcome again. Um, well, Michael will be doing a presentation, sharing a presentation with us, which actually is gonna be available. Eduardo will be sending that presentation later on. Michael, welcome again. Is there mute, Samuel? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now, Samuel? Yes, yes, I can. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Welcome again. Thank you so much, uh, Samuel, for your. Uh, elaborate introduction. I appreciate that and thank you for facilitating this event over the past few days. You've made it very, very easy for us to connect. Thank you. I appreciate your effort. Fernando, a dear friend, you have always been an inspiration. Thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> Since uh, our time at uh, Harvard at the Kennedy School, you were one of the most inspiring and active uh, members, not just because uh, of your background, but uh, also because the scope of your thinking, you always had this large um, perspective and you're always involved and active in a very dynamic uh, spirit and always concerned about you know, global issues, uh, not just from a Mexican uh, perspective. I appreciate your invitation and I'm very proud and I cherish a lot our friendship. I hope that uh, soon after this COVID thing is over, I would have the opportunity to come and visit your beautiful country. I know there are many, many Lebanese uh, there in uh, Mexico. I hope they're contributing in a good way to the economy. And, uh, and I'm sure you have friends there. And when I come, I would like also to meet um, your family and also many of the members of your esteemed uh, uh, association. Um, I would like to start by uh, suggesting that this is, this becomes a conversation because I have I read a little bit about your association. I have asked Samuel also a few questions. Um, it's very impressive how you include a diverse and rich uh, number of people. So uh, whoever is uh, attending now is participating in this uh, webinar. I would like you to help me and make this an active conversation because I am sure we can all learn from each other. I will do now, what I will do is I will try to use my perspective from the 30 years or so that I spent in the media. I spent much of my time in Reuters in more than 22 countries. And my last job was, I was the CEO for Reuters in the Middle East. So, so, um, so I always may try to maintain this global perspective, looking at news from a global dimension. And I will also introduce my, uh, my, uh, my interest also 
in the subject of leadership to see how we can look at things um, from a global perspective, but also introduce the leadership dimension. My talk will be divided into three parts. Part number one, I will go from macro and zoom in into the micro. So I will talk about the global challenges uh, post the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And from there, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Mexico, um, zooming in a little bit. And uh, so that I can then move to the third part to suggest how we exercise leadership or in, uh, from the perspective of Mexico or from the perspective of the global community so that we adapt, survive and thrive uh, in the world in the current reality and in the world that is coming post uh, COVID-19. So I'm going to go for the, from the macro uh, to, the, to the micro. I'm going to share my slides. I'm going to share my slides. And uh, we're going to go through the slides. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to interrupt and ask. And more importantly, if you have any comments to make on the subjects, please jump in. Because as I said, let's step into our collective experience and, uh, and intelligence. Now, um, the, to begin with, I would like to highlight a number of key principles, almost philosophical principles, that draw the parameter, define the parameter of this talk and my thinking in general, especially in regard to our subject. So this is the definition. Everything I say is going to consider that whatever the points I will mention now are the pillars of this conversation. Number one, that life is dynamic. Life is not static. So nothing is fixed. Everything is in constant motion from the Big Bang uh, till uh, eternity and even before the Big Bang, you know, we don't know the universe and every component of the universe is a state of motion. So that's the first pillar or fact of life or nature of reality that life is dynamic. The second thing is because it's dynamic, nothing stays the same and everything is changing, as you know. So we're always living in a state of constant change. The third element, <clears throat> it is called the concept or the principle of entropy. And this is the second uh, uh, law of thermodynamics. Basically, entropy means that over time, things degenerate, things move into chaos. Everything in the end will collapse and die. Hence, the importance of paying attention to things. So even if we do nothing, life will continue in a dynamic and changing state, but it will eventually go towards entropy, i.e. a state of collapse. That's why we need to pay attention to things. That's why the concept of adaptation is so important, because if you don't adapt in an environment that's dynamic, that's changing, where the general trend of things is going by default into collapse, into a state of chaos, then you will have an existential problem and we will die. And this is something to remember at all levels, at a personal, family, organizational, business, you know, country, and also at a global community level. The other point is that you can't defeat the fundamentals. If you don't deal with the fundamentals, as stated by the laws of physics, as stated of the laws of human behavior, then it will not work. There are no shortcuts in life. You can't, over time, ignore the fundamentals. Tactically, may, you might do cut and paste, but without looking at the foundational issues, without looking at the fundamentals, then things will collapse. So we have to keep in mind always the fundamentals. The sixth point, is the concept of actions and consequences. Every action we take has consequences. And every action we don't take, if we have to, there will also be consequences. So there is no escape of the concept of the philosophical concept of consequences. The only thing you get to choose is the poison, the nature of the poison you drink. There is no escape from the poison if you don't deal 
with the fundamentals. If you don't adapt, if you don't take care of things so they don't fall into the concept of entropy because things are changing and things are always in a dynamic state. So consequences are important. The last point uh, or before the last is leadership. We need leadership because without leadership, people will make the wrong actions. Mexico will take the wrong steps. Your organization, you as the head of a family will make the wrong decisions, wrong actions, and that will lead to negative consequences. And without leadership, you, you people will ignore the fundamentals, will go into shortcuts, and that will create damage, and it will fail the process of adaptation. That's why leadership is super important in the context of what we will talk about now. The last point, which is not on this slide, is the concept of the impact of stress. Every time there is a stress on a system, laws of physics say the system will crack at its weakest point. Why am I saying that? Because COVID now is putting stress on the entire global community in all its dimensions. Every side, economic, you know, geopolitical, uh, social, you name it. And what's happening now is that wherever there is a crack, there is a point of weakness, that there is a point that hasn't adapted in the process of survival of going forward, it will be under pressure and it will crack. So what will I talk about now is especially highlighted because of the impact of COVID as it's putting the system, the entire global system, as it's putting Mexico and your entire organizations and families and maybe yourself also under stress. And that will make as I said, the weakest point appear and collapse and come to the surface. All the tension will come to the surface. So these eight points are the parameters or the underlying philosophy of what I'm going to talk about from now on. Let's keep them in mind so that we can move forward. These are the pillars of our thinking. When we talk about global challenges, there are a number of global challenges, a number of them starting with the classic global challenges, like you know, the threat of nuclear war, like the threat of pandemics, like the threat of disintegration into you know, collapse of the world order. There is the issue of food, issue of uh, water supplies, issue of education, issue of health, issue of overpopulation. There are many, many, many dimensions to the current and the foreseeable global challenges. What I will do, as you can see on this slide, I will highlight only five of them because talking about all of them is too much and is without the scope of this you know, um, brief uh, intervention. So I'm going to talk about these five pillars of the global challenges as they are now and as they will continue. And in terms of the impact that this pandemic that we're going through will, will take place. We went into phase one of the pandemic then it calmed down and it's obvious that we're going now into phase two of this, especially as we go into you know, uh, winter. So um, this, is, this happened, hasn't ended. And as per all the um, data that's coming from, you know, uh, from the IMF, from the World Bank and from the OECD and other organizations, it seems that um, whatever we had predicted in terms of impact on uh, global economy, uh, on other aspects of our international community, um, the real impact will be much more. So what we're going to do now is talk about each of these and see how will they be impacted as we move forward. How does that make sense to you now? Is that fine? Is it clear? Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. So that's the framework. Now, I'm going to talk about the issue of uh, geopolitical instability. This was the case before COVID-19, and this is the case now, and it will further continue. These are global risks that were before COVID at the beginning of this um, 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 century, and they continue now, and COVID is making them even bigger. So the size of these challenges, the size of these global risks from a global perspective will increase. If you're a businessman who are running, who's running a global operation, if you are part of a, you know, of a, uh, in a government structure that is part of a global community, if you're a global leader, political leader, you have to think in these terms because this is going to be the nature of reality 
that we will talk about. The first one is the failure of national governance. That's the first point. That's the first risk. What we're facing, what we have been facing as a risk, and will continue to face even more under COVID, is that the national governance, the governance system within the countries, because of the stress of COVID, right, is under the threat of being failed, of collapsing. Things like law and order, things like major, you know, the main institutions of the country. So COVID is putting all of these systems under threat. It, it was already under threat before due to the political tensions that happened uh, because of the trend of nationalization that was sweeping in many countries of the world. So that was putting the entire fabric of society under tension. COVID is making it under more stress. So we have that important risk to pay attention to, the failure of national governance system within uh, the country, the rule uh, of law and the uh, institution that holds society together. The other one is the failure of uh, regional and global governance systems. So things like uh, legal leagues, legal, legal uh, uh, alliances, uh, the United Nations, we already have seen uh, the tensions on the WHO uh, and uh, the World Health Organization and other global entities also. So this already was under tension before COVID. After COVID, let's take WHO as an example. You've seen how the tension spread to that because of the way COVID was mentioned and was managed and how this thing was politicized. So there are regional tensions now in the Middle East. I don't know if you're following up. There are tensions between you know, Greece and Turkey. And there is the tension between Libya and in the Gulf and in Iran mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you know, Israel. And there are tensions within, uh, within Europe. And Brexit already was there before, uh, before COVID. So you name it, you name it. Uh, when it comes to regional and global governance systems, these governance systems that were controlling and ensuring some stability, now they're under pressure because of the stress that uh, COVID has put on the economy and on society and on the local political systems and the international relations that binds countries together. So this is the second risk on a global geopolitical uh, uh, level. The third one is the state of collapse of, or crisis um, uh, in some of the countries. So there's, there's has always been there's a danger that some states will collapse, fragile states will collapse uh, because they already were weak from inside. Now, COVID came and put the entire system under more stress. And as I said earlier, stress makes the system, a weak system crack and disintegrate. So we're, we, that, that, that danger of collapsing state now is much more. And that of course will put pressure on the geopolitical stability in the world. The last one is a civil unrest. We already are seeing that in many countries. I mean, look at Belarus, look at next to you, you know, your neighboring country, United Nations, how issues that have been centuries old, you know, under the skin of the society, they've been sitting there. The stress of COVID has, is bringing all of this to the surface. And there are many other issues will come to the surface. Uh, because that's the nature of reality. When you subject a system to pressure, it will start cracking down. So these four risks at a geopolitical level were already existent before, and now COVID will make them worse. So if you're a political leader, a business leader, working on a global level, you have to keep these risks uh, in, uh, in sight so that you know how to plan strategically for your country and your society and your business. The second kind of risk at the global level that we're talking about is the economic crisis. Now, the economic crisis, of course, this has been one of the major one next to the health crisis because the health, the COVID hit the economy and it's hard, bigger than, you know, far worse than we all expected. And this was highlighted in inflating the issue of inflation itself. There was already the risk of inflation before COVID. Now, with the way many countries are injecting cash, printing money to support their societies, their economies, you can imagine the, the, the impact on inflation. 
And I have heard the report, and that's my view also, that this should continue. You know, Europe and the world economy, the G20 and the United States, uh, especially including, also including Europe, have already injected um, enough cash into the economy. And now there is need to inject even more cash and print more money and inject it into the economy. And that will raise the issue of inflation. And there are alarming uh, signals that if this did not happen, it will make the problem much worse. So um, it is recommended, highly recommended by all thinkers, especially economists, that this continue. We should not withdraw our injection of cash and support of the economy very fast so that we don't repeat the mistakes that had happened in the previous recession in the early 2000s. We should maintain that and keep injecting because otherwise the consequences of uh, economic consequences of COVID will be much worse. But that has no escape except to influence uh, inflation. And, um, and we will see that inflation will continue uh, to rise more than we expected or more than we were worried about before COVID started. The second one is the shortage of critical infrastructure. There were already shortages of infrastructures before on the economic level, you know. Um, communications, uh, roads, airports, uh, financial institutions, uh, you name it. All the elements, the infrastructural elements of economy, many countries were suffering from shortages for that. COVID came and put all of these infrastructures under more stress. Uh, so countries that did not have enough communication system suffered. Countries did not have enough you know, transportation system suffered, countries did not have strong financial institutions and banks suffered because of COVID. So that it has been highlighting, has been highlighted over the past few months because of uh, COVID. The third one is um, the fiscal crisis in many key economies. So many budgets now are in the red because of, uh, because of the COVID and the impact on the economy. Not only that, many countries are defaulting Right? They will, or at least are expected to default in their domestic and global uh, debts because they can't afford it. They have to they are divert all resources to dealing with COVID. At the same time, they have to uh, fulfill their long-term economic obligations to the international community and to, their, uh, to the entities that were lending them, um, um, them money. But they have to make choices and they have to divert uh, finances and, and all the resources locally, and that created all these uh, pressures. The, the other one is the high structure of unemployment. I mean, before COVID, there were unemployment. Now, I don't need to elaborate on this. You can just look into your country and look into the United States and the big major economies and see how employment has been, you know, major, major, you know, at a historic level. Now, I have to say this, that in the previous recessions, Usually, the upper class community, uh, the community that is armed with education and all the you know resources of adaptation, you know this will escape. There's no problem with that. The middle class in this situation um, might also escape some of the pressures because they have enough basic education to you know and tools to adapt. I think what will happen in this situation now, because of COVID as a global threat, the lower part of the society you know, will be hit most because of uh, the nature of, uh, of this uh, threat and the way it is, you know, social distancing and working from home. And, you know, you don't want people to come to your home. There's no, uh, there's no contact. So many people at the, bottom, at the bottom part of the pyramid will also be influenced and that will create many social problems. So these are also global challenges that are derived from the economic crisis. Of course, there's the issue of illicit trade because now it's chaos and the resources of the countries and the economies are mainly towards survival. So all kinds of illegal trades now will prosper, right? And the impact of that will appear sooner or later uh, because the priorities of the economies now are shifted into dealing with the, with the pandemic. So this is the economic front in terms of the current challenges and the foreseeable challenges under the pressure of uh, COVID-19. Now let's go to the climate, climate kind of challenges. As the third component of the major global, you know, um, challenge that humanity 
is facing. Now, before COVID, we already had the issue of extreme weather events. We already had that, right? So now we will have it, but we'll have it in terms of bigger impact because when you have a, you know, a major weather event happening and a major disaster happening, the impact on a society that already is dealing with this pandemic is bigger because you know protection will be less, immunity of the society will be less, priorities will shift to dealing with the crisis. So problems will be much bigger because of these extreme weather conditions. The other point is the failure of the climate change mitigation processes and adaptation. Right? Um, before, even before COVID, we had problems in uh, acknowledging the issues of global warming. And we had, you know, during the Obama, or, uh, um, Obama period, um, before Trump, uh, and I'm not speaking politically here, but as a fact of life, uh, that the spirit was different. After now, the new ad the current administration, things change and the world um, um, mechanisms to deal with climate changes um, mainly um, were weakened and some of them became uh, useless or became paralyzed. So that even will have a bigger impact now as we go into the problems of, um, of, uh, of COVID. And the, the disintegration on the political level and on the global cooperation level that COVID has further accelerated. Because now we have more geopolitical tensions, we have less collaboration and we have more disintegration. So we have less opportunities to come together and deal with these risks. The third one is the major, the biodiversity losses and the ecosystem collapse because all resources now are going into dealing with the pandemic. Right, so who can, who has time now in terms of government priority to dealing with these issues? Yet, you know, you, you hear from, I mean, at least your continent, how the rate of uh, the, the, the disintegration of Amazon forest has speeded up recently. And people are not paying attention because there are other priorities. So because of the pandemic, this threat, this global risk uh, has increased. Of course, they will go also the same for major natural resources, the nature natural, major natural disasters and because of human-made environmental disasters. Just to give you an idea, we have all heard how the, when we were, when there was a global lockdown, how uh, it was clearly evident to the entire world, uh, planet Earth became, uh, started to recover. I mean, you heard how the canals in Venice became so clear that you could see dolphins and fish there, right? We could see uh, from India, the cities of India, you could see Mount Everest. Um, the same thing for Europe. Uh, the climate started recovering and the pollution and noise and the way planet was shaking due to all of this economic movement and movement of people. So it became evident during that lockdown period, the impact that civilization or humanity is having on the global uh, ecosystem and global climate. And I expect that when um, after this is over, all of this argument will be used and the tensions between those who uh, argue against the reality of global warming and global threats or uh, environmental threat and those who are uh, supporting uh, the evidence that this exists will this tension will be even further increased because uh, what happened during COVID, the lockdown provided uh, rare evidence about the impact that human beings are having on nature and the future of humanity in general. Now I'm going to go into the technological uh, the, the, um, threats that are facing humanity and how this has been further increased due to uh, the COVID-19. And there will be even a bigger challenge after in the post COVID-19 world. The first one is the um, adverse consequences of technological advances. I'll just give you an example of what that means. We have all been hearing about the impact of artificial intelligence and how this face recognition systems and surveillance and how all of this you know, has issues when it comes to um, privacy issues, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to confidentiality, when it comes to you know, respecting, um, uh, respecting um, the, the laws and order that guard uh, human uh, interaction and their confidential in uh, dynamics. Now, because of the pandemic, this has fallen behind as a priority. 
Now you have all these applications that track your where you are, and they track also who have been you in, in touch with. And, and just think of China as an example, how um, all of these mechanisms that track people, say surveillance people, uh, are now easily in use. And the question is, this has been already a threat before COVID as a, as a technological you know, governance threat for humanity. So after COVID now, it will become even worse because people have uh, made them as a second priority because of the threat of you know, health. And now there is the danger that they become part of life and they become part of our new reality. So all of this has increased the risk of these technological advances on humanity to go forward. The other one is the breakdown of critical information infrastructure. What does this mean? This means, my friend, now this has, the, the COVID problem has shown the importance of having, you know, using internet for commerce, for interaction, and the way we're interacting now, and how things moved in that direction. Now, problems will appear uh, if, as we continue to have more, uh, lean more on this, on using the, this technology, that these systems might collapse the current global infrastructure and even local one as we move heavily into using them. I mean, it's just a miracle that the internet has not crashed on the global level with all this traffic that happened after COVID. But as this continues, as this becomes the new norm, as you know, <laughs> this pressure will continue at the global level, but mainly in some countries, especially in developing countries, um, they will not be able to cope with it. And they will not even have enough money to upgrade it because they spend most of their money on dealing with the economic issues and the health issues. So that even opened the doors to a cyber attacks because now, you know, in the past, you used to be inside your organization to log into the server, you used to do it internally. Now people are working from home and they're logging into their servers externally. So all these firewalls now have become vulnerable. So people can easily go into these servers, right? And the issue of cyber attacks and cybersecurity has become more highlighted because of the, the COVID thing. And we already, this was already a problem in political issues, you know, when we were talking about interventions in elections in the United States and in Germany and in other places. Now, as, as this, these firewalls are becoming more vulnerable, because our, of our reliance on you know, this uh, technology now, uh, this, this issue will become even a bigger risk as we move forward. The last part in the technological threats is the issue of the massive incidence of data fraud and threat, because now we're dealing now mainly also all, uh, online. So uh, the original threat of, of fraud and, and identity theft were, are now much bigger because what choices do you have now except doing business through 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 the through this internet technology? Now there's also issue of broadband that is not enough available enough in many of especially developing countries. There's issue that in many countries there's not enough infrastructure for you know brick and mortar organizations to have a digital infrastructure to move their business digitally. So they will eventually suffer and vanish because they can't do business anymore when people are you know, uh, asked to uh, maintain social distancing and <clears throat> to stay home. So all of these problems on, a, on, a, on an international level have increased in scale uh, in the post-COVID world. The last point, as you know, is that our health system was already suffering in the past. Now COVID has, of course, as you know from Mexico and other countries, Brazil, it's a disaster what's happening there. India, you know, I was reading yesterday, 76,000 cases you know, in one day. Can you imagine 76,000 cases? This is what's recorded. God knows how many hundreds of thousands are not uh, detected and they're spreading COVID, uh, this uh, corona everywhere. So already this was a problem for many countries in the world including the bigger countries, the, the first world countries. So this has now proven to be a major, major issue. And one of the threats to humanity is that we have to deal with this as soon as possible. It is expected that it is by norm, by default, every year we have two uh, COVID-like uh, pandemics that start, but then they eventually die. Two per year, we don't hear about. We heard some of them, MERS, SARS, and other ones. Uh, but with, current, with the current 
collapsing or at least suffering uh, of the global health system. Can you imagine if we have a new one coming from China or other places? I mean, the entire medical community is already uh, under so much pressure and exhausted. Uh, hospitals are, are out of space and technology is not catching up. So this is going to be a major survival issue. It was before, it was before, and many people spoke about it and asked that we are ready, but we, humanity, we did not uh, listen, of course, because we always operate in a crisis management mentality. But now it is firsthand and we have to allocate resources to build up this uh, this reality in this um, in this in this post-COVID global uh, global challenge, we have to create new global protocols at the global level. You can't now afford to hide such information from the world. You have to immediately inform the entire planet, and you have to make sure that there are enough immunity system within your healthcare infrastructure that takes care of such events if they if they start if they come up in the future. So these, my friends, uh, are a summary or sort of a global overview of the main challenges to humanity, to the global community, to planet Earth uh, that existed just before COVID-19 and that exists now and that has been inflated and highlighted and increased in risk as global risks, right, after COVID-19. As I said, I haven't mentioned the risk of, you know, um, tensions. Uh, between um, you know the superpowers, I haven't mentioned about you know China and the United States and you know this multipolar system and the reorganization of the global order. Harry Kissinger, I'm sure most of you know who he is, spoke a few months ago about life will be completely different after you know COVID. The entire world order will change. Uh, he didn't say why. He didn't say how. He left it vague. Uh, I agree with him, of course, but. Maybe it has been exaggerated a little bit, but still fact of matter is that we can see the tensions already. We can already see them. So, so all of these, all of these now are part of reality and have been increased. I mean, before COVID already China and, and the United States had already tensions. And after COVID, it became far more and, uh, and expected that things will further increase as we uh, move further in Italy, you know, Europe, the disintegration of Europe. Um, who knows what will happen if there is a wave two of uh, coronavirus, you know, spread in Europe. So we're talking about major, major global threat. And unfortunately, we have a major issue of global leadership now that looks at not just national level challenges, but global level challenges and forgets the part that we are all connected. That if they, you know, if they messed up in China, Mexico will pay. If they mess up in Mexico, you know, I don't know, Russia will pay. So this is a fact. It's now it's more obvious than ever. But unfortunately, we live in a time where uh, there are many politicians, but there are not many state people, you know, state politicians, state level of historic uh, magnitude who can look at with global perspective, who could look at entire humanity rather than domestic short term, you know, uh, shallow uh, politics. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to uh, go into uh, the Mexican dimension a little bit. So um, I'm going to now talk about the challenges that Mexico have. But I say that uh, with caution because in my talks, when I give you know, public speeches uh, uh, all over the world and I talk about domestic issues, I'm very cautious because I, um, remind myself that we should always have the humility when we talk about the domestic problems of other countries uh, and not to pretend that we know them more than the countries themselves. You guys are the expert, uh, you know your problems best and you love your country and uh, uh, other people have thoughts, but nobody should claim that they know your problems more than you, you do and uh, or give you insights more than you have. But because this is about Mexico, I would like to share with you so the way the external environment, the global community at a very macro level, uh, looks at Mexico from a macro perspective and highlights maybe some of the macro uh, elements that you have when it comes to your kind of challenges that you have to consider as you deal with the global perspective that we talked about and with the post-corona 
world because these are of far more importance. The first one, as uh, you all know, and you know this anyway, but my the reason I'm saying it is each of these now has more weight, has more damage, has more consequences, needs more um, urgent action, needs deeper thinking, right? Uh, because these with Corona pose more danger than they used to be before. So it's a highlighted issue for the country's leadership to do something about. But as I said, you already know that. So the first point, my friends, is what are the pluses? What, what does Mexico have in terms of assets? What are the assets of Mexico? What makes Mexico unique, unique and what defines Mexico? Number one is your absolutely amazing strategic location. So you stay, you, I mean, if you look at the map, you look, I mean, you cannot be more strategic than this in terms of between you know, North America and Latin America and right next to the United States. So you know that, absolutely strategic location. Uh, and in some of the best parts, you know, in terms of weather and others. You have absolutely competitive uh, cost, um, um, cost basis economy. I mean, very uh, competitive costs when it comes to the economic uh, activity and you have young talent. So, Gracias. Avísame ahorita que se va a ir para atrás, Lucía. Súbate que quede bien ahí. There's noise. Can I continue? Sure, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so if we can mute so that, okay, so fine. So, so of course, you know that you have very competitive when it comes to cost and you have brilliant, 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 brilliant people, right? Very smart. All the Mexicans I know, um, very smart people, open-minded, right? And then you have the size of your market. You have the size of, and the strength of internal market. I mean, your economy alone is, is, is a challenge in terms of satisfying its need. That alone keeps you uh, busy and going, and that's a major, major, major uh, asset, as you know. And then the third and the, the, the fourth one is that, my friends, is your ability to manufacture high technological product, and you already do that. I mean, you still have some space to go, but you have, you're catching up on it when it comes to manufacturing high tech uh, products and machinery. The other element is, that you have an open economy and uh, you brag the fact that you're one of the countries that has the highest number of trade agreements. And that's, that's an asset, that's a wonderful thing because that shows what a great business-minded people you are. And, and there is also the issue of open economy uh, uh, that you try to maintain and that you always uh, keep yourself, uh, try to be at par as the strongest economy next to you. So you always look at, you compete with the strongest. You know the saying, to develop always mingle with people who are you know, more powerful, smarter, richer than you. And that's by default what you do. So you look at the United States and that's sort of your benchmark that you try to approach. Of course, there's a long way as for the rest of the world, but that's also one of your strength points is that you have a high benchmark. Now, from the, this, these are major issues. Now, from the, of course, you, there are many, 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 many more um, pluses that you have, but I see these are one of the main uh, assets that you have from the way the, the world is looking is looking at you, but you are the expert, as I said. Now, from the disadvantages that you need to work on, of course, as a developing world, there's an issue of corruption and the legal system that needs to be fixed. There's an issue of organized crime. There's an issue of poverty, right? Uh, the common thing with the, with, the, with the developing world. And there's an issue of and the uncertainty in the uh, economic growth. And of course, there's an issue of uh, the, 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 the political issue and the uncertainty of the, the politics, the domestic politics, the trade conflicts that happen when you have trade agreements of this level, the cyber threats that you are, that you are constantly having and you will, having be more, you will be having more of that. And you need, of course, to keep upgrading your digital infrastructure. Now, especially when you have the artificial intelligence posing itself as a threat that could be uh, endangering uh, the issue of employment, especially for the lower skilled uh, people. So these are some of the sort of the, the, the problems that you have that I see from a macro perspective, from a global perspective, that will come under far more pressure right now with COVID. 
you can afford to have you know corruption at a certain level when you don't have you know problems like COVID and the impact on its economy. But with that, you know, add corruption to that, it makes it even worse to deal with and to overcome. The same for you know the other problems. So these are, I feel that in terms of challenges, all of these problems that you have now on the slide will become more, you know, um, more in terms of magnitude and a bigger challenge to any administration uh, because of the COVID and post the post COVID uh, situation. And this is not only a Mexico issue. This is also a global issue. So if I look at every country, all of these flags that you see on the slide, each of them have their own problem. There's not a single country, as you know, doesn't have assets and doesn't have liabilities. So now is the time in the post COVID world that we know how to better use <coughs> and optimize the use of our your, 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 assets, <coughs> your assets and how to uh, intelligently deal with the challenges because we can't afford to continue to having these challenges now with something like COVID or what's coming after COVID. When I talk about COVID, and I know you guys are fed up and tired of this conversation because as we have, and many of these points maybe you've heard before and you know already, but when I speak about that, I don't mind repeating it, I'll tell you why, because I am not sure this is going to be the end of the story. There is absolutely no guarantee, no guarantee that next year, 2021, 2022, there might not be something even worse than COVID. Who knows? And what if COVID now uh, evolved into a much more dangerous uh, virus that spreads more, more effectively? So we're really going into a new phase of global threats. I don't see this as a coincidence. Uh, if you tie this, if you tie this with whatever we have been doing as humanity to planet Earth, all this arrogance, all this abuse, short-term thinking, absence of global leadership, if you tie this, the way we have been damaging this only single planet that we have in the entire solar system or the universe that we know that's really uh, habitable, right? What's happening now, COVID, right, might not be just, you know, and it might not just, just, the once you know, in a lifetime situation. What if this is going to be a beginning of you know, a series of genetic mutations that are at the same level? What if this is going to be the nature of reality as we go forward? Is there going to be second kind of COVID, a third kind of COVID? So we have to look at the strengths and weaknesses of our countries, of Mexico, of every country, of the global community with a different level of urgency. That's why I chose some of these highlights to talk about Mexico, to tell you guys, this is not a COVID situation. This is about a new reality because we don't know uh, if COVID is, will ever disappear or will not mutate to even a worse virus, or they might not be sisters and brothers, brothers of COVID that might even make this threat, um, you know, miniature or, mi or minor compared to what's coming next. Now, all of this, all of this, demands leadership. All of this demands leadership. Remember I said from the fundamentals, there are pillars in life, actions and consequences. Remember I said that. If we don't do the right actions, we will suffer the wrong consequences. So COVID will not disappear by itself. Your weaknesses will not go by themselves. And if you ask me, the real problem, if you ask me, if you really now, if I'm going to wear my leadership hat, the real problem is not COVID. The real problem is not the points that I talked about when it came to the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of Mexico. The real problem, my friend, is the absence of leadership at a domestic level, at a regional level, at an international level, because problems is the default nature of life, of reality. There will always be problems. But what's missing, what's, what, is, what demands our contribution is solutions. And who brings solution, especially at a social and a group, group level? It is the task of leadership to bring solution. How does it do that? By mobilizing people. What is leadership? Leadership is about mobilizing leader, people to move forward towards a good purpose. There are three components for leadership. Mobilization, because without mobilization, there's no leadership. People, because it's all about people. And the third one is a good purpose. 
Otherwise, if it's a bad purpose, then it becomes manipulation. And that becomes evil, it becomes malicious, it becomes malevolent, right? So the real problem is not COVID. The real problem is not that we have global challenges and threat. There will always be global challenges. If this is the year 2200, there will be global threat and challenges. Look at history. It's not but a, a big story of global challenges and the way humanity dealt with it in terms of successes and failures and the prices that were paid for that. So I want to talk now about how do we lead transformation in our societies, in our communities, in our countries, in our families, in our departments and organizations, so that we do whatever it takes so to be ready to deal with these challenges, whether they are domestic, departmental, familial, personal, uh, social, you know, provincial, country, local, international risk. You need leadership that will lead transformation. And what I'm, why am I talking about transformation? I'm not talking about change. Change is about incremental change, incremental uh, modifications, incremental, incremental adjustment that happen, you know, gradually with time. And that's important and part of nature. But sometimes in nature, you have big spikes, either they are positive or negative. These big spikes that are a huge turn and shift in the nature of reality in the course of history and events require transformation, which is a big, big chunk of change. Transformation comes from the word transform. So your form, your entire being will be transformed. Trans, it means change. Form means the way you look. So it's a major change. That's why I'm going to talk about uh, how to the, the dynamics of leading transformation. And I'm, I made it deliberately practical. So I'm going to give you practical step wearing my leadership expert hat or leadership interest hat so that this conversation becomes uh, practical and helps you. Otherwise, I don't want to keep it on a macro philosophical and geopolitical level because that's, you know, that is fine in terms of consciousness, but in the end, leadership is about action. It's not just, just about theories and analysis and, you know, and interpretation. We have to act, you have to make an intervention. There are three components for leadership. Observation, we observe. Interpretation, we interpret and analyze. And the third one, we intervene. And what's intervention now? It's about transformation. So these are practical steps that you can use personally uh, in your challenges. And I want you each to think about now so that you use yourself as a case study uh, for an use as an, a personal example in your own life, whether you want your personal life, your familiar life, your departmental, organizational, social, country, responsibility, whatever it is, just think of a personal case study that thinks that needs, needs transformation. This is the following step will be what needs to happen so that you can lead transformation. And if you are in the public sector, in a political uh, community who is leading with these changes, with the challenges that I talked about at the beginning of my intervention of this talk, you can still use the same steps as a state leader, as a statesman or a statewoman to deal with whatever is required to reshape your community to deal with these changes and even at a global level. So let's go to the practical level so that there's a practical benefit to this, um, to, this, uh, to, this, uh, to this conversation with you. Number one, so what do you do when you lead transformation in your organization and community to deal with risks? First thing is to understand, my friends, that the purpose of every organization, every being, everything that exists and is alive is to survive and to grow. This is the fundamental, fundamental philosophy that I use to think about life and to think about leadership. Everything we do, everything we say, we do it for the purpose of survival and growth. There are no exceptions. The reason we're having this conversation now is because of the thought and the perception and belief that when we have this conversation, people who listen will enhance their level of consciousness and will add insights and will help them in their survival and growth journey. So this is the fundamental issue. You lead, you transform, so that you enhance the subject of survival, the purpose of survival and growth. That's why we do things. The second thing is to do that, 
because we live in an environment that continuously changing, we have no choice but to go through the process of adaptation. So leadership is leading people through the process of adaptation. Leadership in Mexico is how to lead the Mexican community and country through the process of adaptation to deal with, to survive in COVID-19 uh, uh, era and to survive and grow beyond or post the COVID-19 era. The same thing for you. You lead transformation in your company to survive in this new now situation, new reality, and to grow when you get out of this reality and things are more stabilized so that you go back to your growth purpose. So leadership is about adaptation also. And that's what you have to lead to in the process of transformation. The third one, my friend, is, uh, is there is no choice when it comes to this. It's not a matter of choice. Leading transformation is not a matter of choice. This is what you see now in the picture is a technological threat that, that could have been solved by transformation. Nokia died because um, they did not, were not able to deal with the disruption that you know, Apple brought. That had, disruption happened to the economy and they failed in adaptation and failed in transforming themselves. And that's why as a company, they died or they are almost dead, at least compared to they used to be. So there's not a matter of choice. The same thing applies now. It's not a matter of choice. If we don't uh, know how to lead transformation so that we survive during the changes, the challenges of COVID-19, we will die. Bodies of people who are collapsing and dying now by the thousands are dying because they're not able to adapt to dealing with the threat of the virus by producing the right immunity system. So, uh, Threats like COVID are also imposing that we go into uh, transformational leadership mode, not just technological one. The other one that we're facing now is the political and geopolitical tensions like the tensions we have now between the United States and China. These are also other reasons why we should go into the process of transformation because the world is changing geopolitically. So you have technological requirements or disruptions that demand leading transformation. You have uh, uh, physiological and biological reasons, health reasons, right, to your entire physical presence. And you have geopolitical also reasons that you have to adapt to through a process of transformation because definitely the world is changing and it's obvious that China and, and the United States are, are more and more into uh, a, a, a direction of collision. Today I read a report that says China has just opened the world's largest satellite manufacturing compound. They're going to be producing satellites by the masses, just like they produce shoes by the masses. Can you imagine the scale? China now will start producing satellites. So imagine the threat that that will impose, right? So, and it's out of control. Chinese technology now, the way they have been creating momentum, it will be hard to stop. And that will take more both countries into definitely a, a state of more tension and possible different kinds of levels of, uh, of, coll of collision. The other important element to do to lead transformation is what's happening next to you. And that's the, 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 the elections in the United States because that will also shape the biggest country in the world economically and politically and militarily and will have an impact on geopolitics and the mindset behind leading uh, the global community, at least politically and economically. So that also is the reason for transform, transformation. People who did not transform after Trump took over suffered. People who will not transform if Trump loses will suffer. People who will refuse to transform if Trump wins, they will also suffer because Trump will be even a different kind of Trump I'm not talking politically now, I'm talking in terms of history and leadership in his second term because he has nothing to lose now. And people behave differently, uh, president behave differently in the second term. So that's also another reason to, to transform. Now, how do you transform? There are a number of philosophical concepts and also practical concepts that you need to take into consideration while you're thinking about transformation. Um, as I said, these are fundamentals. Now. I know for sure that you know them, but as I always say when I talk about leadership, this is not about intellectual conversation. 
if you have read 50 leadership books and you have like 600 degrees and 50 PhDs, right? And it's all in your mind, but you don't exercise what you learn and what you know, it is completely useless. So I always go to the fundamentals and make sure that when I'm advising companies as an advisor or as a member of the board of directors, executive or non-executive, or in my job, you know, career as CEO, what matters to me more is whether you put what you know into action. Otherwise, it's just a political or a intellectual conversation at a theoretical level. So let's go to them and let's see how you can put them into action because without them, you cannot transform. The principle number one is to what is to let go of whatever is not necessary anymore. The reason that COVID-19 has changed the world is that it has made us discover abruptly that there's so many things in life we don't change, we don't need anymore. And I'll give you a very classical example. Many companies have just discovered that they don't really need to have all their staff in the same place. This is the most classical example. And now they said, even if COVID-19 disappears, we don't really need people uh, in, our, uh, in our premises anymore. So working from home is going to be the norm from now on, right? So whatever technological advances were already in place, but they were not properly utilized before, COVID-19 has pushed us to adopt permanently. So, and that means we change the way we live. That means we have to let go of what is not necessary anymore. And that's how nature works. That's how evolution works. What the DNA does in the process of evolution is that it lets go of all the genes that is not necessary anymore. That's what was happening to us. We are losing our wisdom tooth now. Why? Because we don't need it. So whatever has no need is not needed anymore. Nature discards it and we have to do the same. So you, as you lead your companies, departments, organizations, countries, families, whatever, is businesses, you have to decide what do you really don't need. And you have to have the courage to let go because that takes courage because we're usually attached to them. There's no time for sentiments or nostalgia. We have enough time to have to prove that the old, some of the old things do not need, are not needed anymore. So it's time to let them go. And you have to decide what that is. And you have to act on it because leadership is action. It's not just talk, it's action. The second thing that you have to think about in the process of leading transformation is what is the core assets that you have, the strengths that you need to absolutely protect? What is that you need to protect? Your core strengths. Now, theoretically, you know that, but have you really defined it? If you define what is your core strengths of your company, organization, university, family, you know, culture, community, economy, finances, business, whatever it is which line of business is core, whatever it is, you have to absolutely define what your core strength is. And this has been already highlighted because the, the crisis, although it has a health facade, it has also a manifested economic and practical and technological you know, dimensions. And it, it became obvious what is core to us, what should be protected, what we cannot do without, right? So you have to decide in your own case study that you're thinking about now as we talk, what is core that you should keep in your mind because it is absolutely your main source of strength. The third one is what should you acquire as a new element? What is it that you don't have that you should acquire? Skills, knowledge, technology, thinking, mindset, habits, values, virtues, ways of behavior, ways of communication, you name it. What is it that you need to learn that you don't know is completely new to you and to your department, team, people, community, nation, you name it. We have to acquire that. And you have to make a conscious and intelligent, smart decision on defining it and on putting the right mechanisms to ensure that this is incorporated in your system. The fourth one is what should be underemphasized? What should you do less of? It is not core, but it's important, but you don't need to do it as much as you did, but you can't get rid of it because you need it. So what should be underemphasized in your company, organization, department, and the rest? And the fifth one 
is what should be overemphasized? What should you do more of? So this is how biology and evolution works. And this is how leadership should be working in terms of its philosophical thinking, its roadmap, its philosophical pillars of thinking, of, of planning, right, of strategizing, so that it can mobilize people along these uh, pillars. And this has to be applied on two dimensions, physiologically and psychologically. So think of your physiological dimension, right? Business structure, you know, whatever it is, anything that is materialistic and physical, and in terms of mindset, intellect, skills, values, virtues, <clears throat> culture. So on the psychology and on the physiology level, you have to apply all these components, what you keep, discard, underline, and under emphasize, overemphasize, and and what you learn as a new skill. It has to happen at, at these three dimensions. And it has to apply to the following types of adaptations. There are a number of times of transformations, right? You have to do them at in synchronization mode. What are they? The structural adaptation. So what do you have to change on a structural level, right? The fundamentals, the structure. The second one is the procedural, the way you do things, the how of things procedures and policies and regulations and, and way of doing things. The third one is the mindset, the mentality, the intellectual one, you know, the way we think about them. And the fourth one, of course, it is the behavioral one. How do we act? So if you fail in terms of leading transformation at any of these, the chances that you will survive and grow in dealing with a post-COVID threat or challenge at a local, domestic, personal, you know, developmental, departmental, global, national level will fail. You need to think at that level. If Mexico does not handle its challenges at this level, the way things are happening will become overwhelming because you and I already have problems and we're already in a crisis management mode. So COVID made everything much worse and what's coming might be even bigger. So we need to act at that level, we cannot take this lightly uh, anymore. And we have to do that with a positive mindset because this is the nature of reality. This is not a disaster, ladies and gentlemen. This is what's happening, it's not a catastrophe. It's not a disaster. This is the nature of reality. This is not, oh my God, no. Every generation had its own challenges. And in my thinking, every 10 years or so, seven to 10 years, Every human being or family or business or society or community or structure or, you know, an entire system will be facing a tsunami at that level. So we have to take it with a positive mindset because it's the nature of reality and you can't argue with reality because every time you argue with reality, you fail. Reality always wins. So make sure that you have a positive mindset. This is not a panic mindset. This is how to, how to be a realist, not how to panic. This is not a crisis. It is much more important because it's fundamental. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that adaptation is a constant process. This is not a once in a lifetime thing. And you know that for, for sure, but it doesn't matter if you and I know it. We have to make it our way of living. Now, it doesn't have to be a stressful situation. It has to be a way of life. Now, we all need stability, right? Because that's human nature. But we should always plan things so that a part of reality is always unstable. We're always 10%, 20%, something is changing around us. And we do have to do this strategically if we're thinking with a leadership mindset so that the system does not rest. It is not destabilized because otherwise it will panic and be paralyzed and it will freeze or, or will be you know, we'll lose, uh, we'll lose concentration. At the same time, it will not be, you know, stuck in a stagnation zone. They call it comfort zone. I call it the diminishing zone because what happens is that you're not really comfortable. You're dying slowly without noticing. So it's a diminishing zone. That's my definition of it. It's not a comfort zone. So what you do is you do adaptation as a constant mindset, but you do it with a positive approach because you celebrate it and you make it part of your challenge as you go forward in the journey of survival and growth. So how do you do that? You have to have, you have to be good in building a compelling story to sell 
and you have to emphasize on the benefits. So in your company, your country, you have to build a compelling story. If it's not a compelling story, it is very hard to ask people to engage in a process of transformation because with transformation, there will be pain because it's major change. So you have to emphasize the benefits that relate to them. That's how you make it compelling. You have to make it a survival and growth opportunity issue for your audience. So you build a compelling story. Then you make, you create a state of urgency because people will never transform or not, I'm not talking about change. I'm talking about real fundamental transformation. I'm talking about, you know, turnaround. I'm talking about, you know, what Lee Kuan Yew did to Singapore. I'm talking about what Gandhi did to India. I'm talking about during the process of independence. I'm talking about, you know, nation builders did to create their nation. I'm talking about Lou Gerstner, the way he changed IBM. I'm talking about Steve Jobs, the way he changed Apple after he took over. So you have to create a state of urgency. Otherwise, no urgency. People will not be gearing towards transformation. They will take it easy. You have to light fire under their chair so that they can move so fast. But you have to do it intelligently through a compelling, motivating story that emphasizes the benefits. And you have to involve everybody, of course, because if they're not involved, they will become a force uh, that you will be have a burden on you. So the more you involve people around you in your department, in your team, in your family, the more you bring them, make them part of this transformation team, give them ownership, the easier it will become. Also, you have to create a spearhead team, right? You have to create a spearhead team. Just look like, look at the spear. What really does the penetration is not the entire body. It's like the spear is like a two meter thing or two and a half meter thing. The part that does the penetration is the metal arrow at the, at the, at the, at the, at the top. So you have to create that metal arrow that will penetrate. So you have to find a team that will spearhead. If you look at the bell curve, right? The majority is under the bell. Right? The minority are lagging behind, they will drag you. The, the middle are passive and they're easily uh, oriented by opinion leaders, by influencers. And then the minority on the side are people who are enthusiastic, they get it. So you have to know how to define them and use them as your core team of commando, of strike force, of your elite force, so that they become, they create momentum and they create change and they inspire and lead the majority that is lagging behind. And you have to know how to define these people and motivate them. Then you have to over-communicate. Again, I'm telling you things that probably most of you know, but as I said, the, the test is not in knowing them intellectually, because if you fail in applying any of these, then transformation will suffer and your survival and growth, especially in times of crisis like COVID and post-COVID will suffer and you will pay the consequences. So over-communicate as much as you can. And the moment you thought that you have over communicated, you're not even halfway through. You will get bored, fed up, tired. It doesn't matter. Keep saying it until people get fed up. And when they get fed up, don't stop, keep doing it. Become a broken record because people pretend that they'll get it, but they didn't, right? So keep saying it until you lose your breath. That's how it works with people. Then you have to know how to reframe the issue of stress. So you have to change from a stress situation into a positive situation. You have to move it from stress into excitement, stress into a challenge, stress into a race, stress into competition. So you have to reframe the tension that we build that will come up with your system as it goes into dealing with the post COVID uh, threats to your survival and growth. So you have to reframe it. And that also requires a smart and intelligent leadership skills to know how to present it. Of course, you have to please respect the past because people will be losing their past that they adore and they're attached to and they have memories with. So you have to respect it and honor it so that people don't go against you. Otherwise you will suffer. You have to be empathetic as much as possible. Be empathetic because people will be in pain and you have to hold them and grab them and hug them and be sympathetic and empathetic to their pains. Otherwise you will disconnect with them and they will not follow you. They need you to be a human being. Leadership is about being a human being because you're leading humans and humans are mind and heart, not just mind, they're also heart. You have to lead with your heart and your mind. Use all your resources because you will need them. Transformation is a super hard job, right? So use every tool you have. Don't let anybody, anything 
you know, safe. Use all your weapons. This is the major weapon of your survival and growth. So use every possible resource, right? Continuously reassess because you will get it wrong and you will have to continuously evaluate so that you refine your moving forward process. This is the process of transformation to prepare for post-COVID survival and growth and for the current reality. Keep a learning mindset because as you will assess the situation, you will have to learn so that you can apply what you learn and refine, keep fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning, because nobody gets it right from the first time. You will also need to get all the help that you can because nobody can do it alone. So this is not time for arrogance. You have to be open-minded and humble. You can do it alone. This is not about your story of heroism. This is about succeeding in mobilizing people. So get all the help that you can, right? Don't make it about you. It's not about ego. Of course, there will be resistance. So you have to learn how to deal with resistance. You have to do that intelligently, right? And there is an entire dynamic. I have written a 500-page book about how to deal with uh, how to deal with resistance. And I'll show you the book now. It's not an advertisement, but you will like you will like the the, the you will like the title. It's called How to Trump the enemy, right? It's the Trump, the Trump here does not mean Trump as a president. It means how do you overcome and outsmart the competition? And by the way, I sent the first copy to Donald Trump himself and got his permission, documented letter to use this title. So he, ha he has it as his first copy, right? And it's a 500 page uh, thing, 480, right? It's all about how do you strategy strategies for dealing with your leadership opponents? Why is this important? Because when people's leadership efforts fail, transformation fail, not because of lack of allies, it's because of lack of how to deal with your opponents, saboteurs, your resistors, and they will be at different categories in all aspects of your reality. Internal, external, family, friends, colleagues, constituencies, competition, you name it, right? So you have to know how to do that. Right? Otherwise, transformation will fail. Of course, you have to be persistent. Right? Be persistent because this is a long, long, long journey. And if you're not persistent, you will give up. It is going to be bumpy, full of failures and successes. Get ready. Get ready. This is going to be a very difficult journey. Right? There's going to be a lot of turbulences. So fasten your seatbelt. Celebrate every success. Learn from every failure. It is not going to be an easy ride. Never give up because it's going to be uh, one of the most important journeys of your life to save your company, your family, your department, your country. Otherwise, if you don't survive, you die. If you don't grow, you will not survive, and then you will die. It's not a matter of, it's not a luxury. You have to do that. And my last two slides is adapt or die. You know that it is not, this is not, and this has never have been true as it is now because of the, current challenge and but because of what's coming next. I'm not just worried about, you know, of course I'm worried about the, 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 the health issues, but I see from a geopolitical macro perspective, the next five, 10 years, God help us. It's going to be really, really turbulent as this stress continues to manifest itself on the different facets of societies everywhere. This is just the beginning, right? You know, it's like divorce. I know it's a bad thing, but, uh, but it's, uh, maybe it's not a nice example. Uh, the, most of the problems of divorce happen after, you know, when you start the process, after the consequences, right? So, because then shows things come to the surface. So, so adapt or die. And the, my last point, ladies and gentlemen, is that in the end, in the end, in the end, all of this comes to one point. It is a leadership challenge. You, this cannot happen without leadership take out leadership, all of this will fail. The reason societies have failed is not because they did not understand the situation. It's not because they did not diagnose it properly. It is not that because they didn't have the intellectual capacity to come up with solutions. It's not that because they don't have smart people. It's not that because they don't know how to articulate it. I am sure Mexico, your organization, is full of brilliant people who cannot just solve the problem of Mexico intellectually, but the entire world. But the things, things are they are, 
the way they are now is because of shortage of leadership, because the core of leadership is to mobilize people through the journey of survival and, trans and growth, and that's what's at stake now. It's all about now how do we make it through COVID and how do we turn this into an opportunity for humanity and for your country and for all the countries of the world and for your organization and yourself. I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if this has taken too long. Um, and I open now the, chat, the, the space for uh, your contributions because I'm sure we can all learn a lot from, from your input. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. I think it has been a, a great uh, uh, presentation that you have made and uh, especially that there is a lot of things that took a lot of uh, notes about. 10 pages that I took notes about what you were saying about the presentations and so forth. And there are some uh, questions of the, or comments of the people that are actually, uh, I would like to transfer, you know, and share to, to, with some of them to ask the questions uh, directly. Uh, but I have a, a, just to start, you know, at the very beginning, you mentioned um, uh, several key points on the, uh, uh, of the, of the main principles. And one of them I think is very important is the adaptation. Are we gonna be adapting ourselves to this new reality that we are, that we are facing? Uh, you mentioned several times, for example, the case of uh, China, the case of the US, and, um, and putting that perspective into Mexico and where we are living, as you know, uh, our main trade partner here in Mexico because of the strategic location is actually the United States. And uh, we depend a lot on the US. 85% of our trade actually goes to the U.S. How do you perceive, you know, from an external point of view, for example, the trade war between China and the U.S., how eventually we're lo really looking forward that we could get a benefit out of that, but how do you perceive from the outside? I mean, because we really believe that the, instead of saying a collateral damage, I will say that we will have a collateral benefit out of that. What is your perspective from the outside? Um, my perspective, uh, my friend, is that uh, this is going to become a more uh, tense uh, and heated uh, interaction. If uh, Trump wins, of course, it depends a lot on the mindset behind the, the current and future expected leadership of the United States. So this is going to become more tense. Um, for many reasons. I think even if Trump did not win, it would still become an issue uh, because for um, one main reason, I don't think China is stoppable now. So China is unstoppable. The way China in terms of size, momentum, money, uh, financial strengths, technology, uh, the solidity of its system, the solidity of, the, of its leadership, the way the structure of the country is run now um, and uh, the stability they have they have all the components of a very long-term trajectory that has one direction and that's expansion. Of course, you uh, know of the Silk Road, new Silk Roads that they have been building through the entire world, you know, coming to, to Pakistan, through the subcontinent, Sri Lanka, you know, and uh, now Iran, and then the Gulf, and now um, and, and, and Italy, and so, this is, they're investing hundreds of billions of dollars to create the infrastructure of a very long time expansion mode that is going to take into, well into the entire century of, of 20, 20, 20, of, you know, 2000 until 2100 and beyond maybe. So this is a long term thing. And regardless of who is in the White House, this will continue now from the outside, the language will change if, let's say, Biden was elected. And uh, sometimes, even if Trump was elected, sometimes the language might go become softer or more uh, or sharper. But the fundamentals are there. China is unstoppable in terms of growth. Uh, now, will there be military growth, military expansion, political expansion? I don't know. I remember when I was at Princeton, I went through a course. This was 15, 20 years ago. <clears throat> That said, is China a friend or an enemy? Imagine how how how, how old is this story? Twenty years ago, people have been discussing this in the past, and look where China is now. So the tension will continue. That's number one. Now, um, so China will fight with everything it can to maintain its uh, current position, 
and to expand uh, regardless of what the United States is, is, uh, is doing and will continue to do. Now, will the US uh, uh, abandon this battle, uh, trade battle with China? No, because also it has so much to lose. So I think this will be in more intense. Now, part of this will reflect on the supply chain, which we didn't talk about as part of the repercussions of COVID because they were going to be rearranged. You know, globalization will change to a certain extent. And it's this talk that the supply chain might be, you know, uh, driven away at least partially from China. Now, people like your country and other countries are talk are dreaming that they will attract the supply chain, right? This is a possibility and it's a prospect that you guys and other countries should be paying very good attention to. But you're not alone. There's also Vietnam and there's also Thailand and Malaysia and Indonesia and all these other countries that have, and India and all and have, uh, like you, uh, all the competitive advantages that you know one can think of, and they've already have been looking at China as a competitor in terms of you know attracting human, attracting uh, American business. So you are also competing against those. And part of the talk also is to attract the supply chain back to America, right? To you know made an America sort of uh, philosophy thing, or or title. So so is there an opportunity for you? Yes, there is. Are you going to be the only people who are competing for th that you capture a greater share of the rearrangement of the supply chain? Uh, yes, there are going to be opportunities, but you're not going to be alone. And let me remind you of what I said on purpose at the beginning, and that is the following. You need to get prepared in terms of the fundamentals. The fundamentals. Rearranging the supply chain is not a short-term strategy. You don't move factories um, and spend hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it was re -est estimated about more than a trillion dollar to rearrange the supply chain from China. You're not going to get that on a you know short term thinking. You know at least from the people who are involved in, uh, in terms of you know the business owners, they they will do this based on a long term uh, view. So they need to think about long term issues, stability in all the other components that need to be exist, technology. Uh, uh, governance, corruption, legal systems, you know, availability of technology, uh, that be the presence of uh, um, employment. So the question is, is Mexico ready to be a, a competition, a competitor, compared to the other contenders who are, you know, lobbying to become uh, some people, you know, the, the, the people who will inherit some of the supply chain of China Right um, to their countries, are you are you are you going to win this battle? Do you have the fundamentals to to beat them? Can you do that? That's why I said you need to pay attention and go to the fundamentals now, and it has to be uh, in a transformational mindset, giving it priority with urgency, so that when this becomes ready, when people start talking about this, you have a compelling case to take to the world, to take to the world to say that, guys, OK, you have so many other uh, options, Vietnam and others, but we're also next to you. And this is what we offer you. And the thing is that people know you. I mean, the United States, they know you very well. So you can't really, uh, you, can't, you can't accept be transparent with, with them. So you really have to present a compelling case to them to convince them that they, you are a better choice than other people who are looking at the same opportunities. I think you have a chance, but it all depends on the leadership that will apply in your public sector and equally so in your private sector to present a compelling uh, case to, uh, to, the, uh, to the new economy that will emerge uh, soon in terms of global, you know, rearranging globalization and shifting supply chain. Thank you very much. I will share, I will share the, the, the word to one of the people who actually to have it more interactive. There is a, a, a colleague and also a professor also from the Monterey Tech, Jesus Garza, who would like to make a presentation. Jesus, are you there so you can make it directly? Yes, I'm here. Can you uh, guys listen? Yes. Yeah, yes, we can. Please go ahead. Excellent. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, very, very good. Very interesting. I just had a couple of questions. The first one is, related to closing key sectors on the economy. It seems like many countries, particularly populist economies, are trying to close 
um, sectors of the economy as a, as a way to, to foster growth. But uh, my question would be, do you think economic liberalism is dead? And the second thing would be, uh, I don't think it is because in Europe and developed nations, um, economic liberalism has, has, has actually increased or enhanced productivity through competition. And I'm going back to what you said about supply chains. It seems that we want to take advantage of supply chain exports to the US. But do you think supply chains will be automated on, on um, robots will make all these this supply chain production processes that we need to focus more on the technology, technological aspects of the future of, of, of job creation, not only supply chain. In fact, China, as you well mentioned, doesn't care about supply chain anymore. They export supply chain to poorer nations, such as the UK and other liberal economies. Do so you think it's, it's a bad idea to depend on supply chains as a, as a way to foster economic growth? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Number one, do I think uh, liberalism, liberal economy will disappear? I think this is an illusion. I mean, we're becoming uh, more connected regardless of the, you know, the new talk about, um, of course, nationalism is, is fine now and, you know, uh, and isolation and contracting back, all of this is fine. But I don't think you can reverse uh, the natural course of history. I always go back to the fundamentals and I learn from nature uh, and, and history. The world has always been global. I mean, we are in Lebanon, you know, our, our, our ancestors, we come from the Phoenicians and the Phoenicians have been some of the masters of globalization 3000 years ago using very primitive boats to, uh, to colonize the entire Mediterranean and go around in Spain. And some people say maybe when they went also to, you know, to, to some of the East Coast of, of America. So globalization has always been there. It will always be here. And nobody can stop the interaction of people and the flow of trade between nations. Because what is the alternative? You readjust your entire production uh, 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 dimension just to uh, focus on local, on local markets or on regional markets or on small, you know, specifically tailored bilateral agreement. And you might go through phases of that. And that's related, I think, uh, this is also related to the, you know, the spirit of nationalism that came recently. But eventually, uh, I think the world is going to become far more connected uh, over time. I'm saying I'm talking over time. Huh? We, we go to up and down, but the trend is more globalization and more connectedness. I don't even like to call it globalization. I think connectedness is a deeper is a deeper concept, and eventually this will continue. And uh, I think it eventually in the, it's in the interest of the companies itself, the economies itself in the US and others to open more market, not close markets. So, I mean, I have full respect for, for, for politics, but one of the major drivers of politics is the economy, right? So, so and major economy, and so especially the deep economy will always want open markets. So that will not happen, that's one. Number two, you're right what you said about China, China, I mean, already it has a huge domestic market, 1.5 billion almost people. That alone, I mean, you need, uh, that alone is, is an entire economy by itself at the global level. That's number one. Number two, they already have already their agreement. They've laid the infrastructure. They have been thinking ahead. Uh, they have been already preempting the tension with the US and they've spent all of this money, you know, cultivating countries and building all these ports. You know, they put 60 billion in, 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 in to build infrastructure in Pakistan, and they put same similar kinds of amount of money in in Singapore, in, in what's his name, in Sri Lanka. They built, they bought, they bought the board, the port there, and uh, Iran now. And the, the, they're not, they're not, they're not naive. I mean, Chinese people have thousands of years of history, and they know how to handle these things. So that will continue. The, the third element is yes, you're very right that technology, and as I said in my presentation when I talk about uh, the economical issue from a geopolitical threat, AI and new advancements will become, will pose a global growth. So one of your change, one of your challenges is automation and the AI and the big data and the entire, you know, all these components of the new economy. Um, but that doesn't stop you from being ready for that as well. I mean, what does AI need? It needs smart people and you need basic infrastructure, right? It doesn't need uh, heavy machinery. So if you invest in that, I know China has built an entire city maybe 
I mean, in, in Chinese language, to focus on developing an eye. So I don't see why a, a Mexico cannot do the same. And even if they need to build robots and intelligent and artificial intelligent machines, why don't you guys become exporters of that? And these things, these people will need also, you know, physical uh, places. So uh, that definitely will be a challenge. Um, what's the choice? To retreat from this reality? No, you have no choice but to become masters of this, to be in the game of artificial intelligence and robotics and become major players in this. And if there's competition, you, you, you take part of it and you win as much as you can. And being next to the US and by adding some other incentives, so why not also attract even that kind of business of economy to you. So AI want to run the new economy or manufacturing. So fine, put some extra benefits and make it AI that when that works or that's made in, in, in Mexico. It is going to be a part of the a new alphabet of, make, of, of the economy at the global level. And we will all have to compete with AI in the future. And you guys are very well placed to do that. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I have a, uh, one of our colleagues have a question, and this this actually enrolled me at some point to a, a lead me to a point where, uh, where the university where I teach, the University of Monterrey. Uh, one of the things that we see in the strategic planning class is how to get the, the, the engagement of the people. And one of the uh, uh, of our colleagues is, ask, is asking, how do you re what are your recommendations in terms of getting the civic engagement in this society that in many cases, for example, you know, Mexico lives in a, in a developing economy. We face all the challenges and any other developing economy it's facing 50% of our entire population is considered poor. So there is a lot of lack of infrastructure and so forth. But how, what are your recommendations to engage uh, that, uh, uh, to get that civic engagement of the, of the, of the people in general especially in terms of uh, things that have to do with development, try to persuade them with the benefits of development, the, uh, the, uh, what are gonna be the main things that are gonna be getting the benefits out of them. Uh, what are your perceptions on those type, uh, on those type of uh, experiences that you may have had in some other of uh, the boards that you participate and the advice that you give to some other countries? Listen, I see when people say 50% of the population is, is, you know, you know, is in poverty, it is, of course, a major social and economic problem, but it's also a, a great opportunity. I mean, if I'm the president and they tell me 50% of the population is, is in poverty, then immediately I have a priority on my agenda. I mean, it's obvious. I look at it as a reservoir, right? Because the poverty there is a consequence of many things. So if you look at the deep roots of these, right, they're obvious, and you guys know them. And of course, one of the main, one of the main, main, um, uh, ways of dealing with that is investing in education and investing in, you know, in, uh, in technological infrastructure and in the internet and the whole thing. And for that, I go a lot to India and I give lots of talks and you know, I sit on many boards in India and in Singapore. I mean, listen, you can't beat India when you talk about tech poverty. Can you beat India? You can't beat India when it comes to poverty. You can't beat China when it comes to poverty. You know, a few, a few, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, what, what was the population of people who are poor in China and India compared to now, right? So you, there's so many cases. You look at Singapore, although it's a, many, it's a small case, but what I'm saying, this is not a new problem. I say again, this is a problem of leadership. If you have the proper leadership who can invest in providing this 50% of the population, and in your case, we're talking about tens of millions of people. If you invest in providing education, if you are providing uh, smart education, it doesn't have to be classical education anymore. Now, so we learn from COVID that you can uh, provide education. It doesn't have to be by building this costly infrastructure of schools and universities. So, if you just develop, you know, um, good uh, internet uh, um, communication systems and provide people with cheap laptop and good connection, right? Then you have people now. Uh, you can easily have people now. Uh, 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 you know, you can invest in the education of people and raise people from uh, from at least poverty at the, at the educational level to a higher standard and make them more prepared in terms of, you know, being ready for the for the to join to to join the labor force and then especially the skilled labor labor force. 
So I see it's a measure of leadership mobilizing the you know the civic community to work at a grassroots level so that you can take the fundamentals that can deal with the issues of education, right? Uh, providing technology, right, to the masses. I mean, you know micro banking, micro financing, right? I mean, everybody knows micro financing. They took financing to the micro level. Why don't you take education and technology and communication to the micro level and take it to all villages and take it to all, you know, all sectors that are that are poor? And why don't you, as a society, as a community, create more of these NGOs? Leadership should divert and encourage NGOs to invest more on them. I don't see, I have studied carefully uh, how China and, 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 and India made it. And the main word that comes to mind is education, especially you know, higher education. And this was 10 and 15 and 20 years ago. They invested in higher, higher education, and then they made, they made sure that they can compete globally. And they sent thousands and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people to the best schools in the world and subsidize them, and they build similar schools internally. Now with internet and distant learning and the whole thing, this has become much easier. So, so what I look at, and to conclude, uh, I look at the 50 million as a major social, ethical, moral, economic problem, of course, but a major opportunity for leadership to do something and use this reservoir as a strategic you know, um, bank that could be used to upgrade everything you have in the workforce, right? By working on this or using the current technology and the current means of edu education and bringing them back. And you can do that in five years and 10 years time. You can easily do that in 10 years time. So it, it, to summarize, leadership has to mobilize more entities, public or private or civic, because I also see opportunities for, for private investment there. So that they can create new models that will go to these poor areas, provide telecommunication, provide smart uh, education, and bring them back, and then immediately uh, recruit them. And you don't need to you use pressures like you know people have to come to the cities and all the you know all the sociological issues and and civic and um, you know modernity issues that come came with migration into 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 cities to do that. People now. From you know COVID and and after after COVID we will be working from their homes. I know a friend who has been uh, sitting in in Barcelona who has been working as a consultant to the Saudi government for months, maybe a year now, providing them high level of consultancy, and he hasn't even been there. All what he has is a laptop, a smart brain, and a connection. So over the long term, if you invest in this, I think you can turn the 50% into an asset, uh, provided you have the, life, the, the, the right leadership. The solutions are there, Samuel. The solutions are there. It has been done in many countries, and we know now why India and China are so successful, because what they did 20 years ago. Well, now we don't have 20 years. So somebody has to take charge of this and start mobilizing all these sectors to putting more attention so that we can apply what they did, best practices modified to your culture, Right? And bring these people into, into the high skilled labor uh, segment and then start competing. Because in the end, the most, the biggest differential that will happen, that will make a difference is the human intellect, right? Is the brain, is the human mind, right? And if you have like 100 million people or 50 million people who are, who are uh, poor in, in, terms of, in terms of IQ, I'm sure there are like 10% of them, maybe 150 plus in terms of IQ, and maybe 5% or 3% absolute geniuses, right? So you already have it. Just find these people, mobilize them, give them the right education, channel them properly into the economy, and they will lead. It's a solvable problem. Absolutely. Yeah, of course, absolutely. <laughs> Well, I think we have we have come to an end, and uh, it was a really great uh, uh, presentation that you have made, and we, we really thank you for sharing those thoughts with, with us. I would like to to pass the word to Mr. Turner to say uh, one last words, but uh, thank you again for for this magnificent. Uh,
presentation that you have made. Mr. Turner, I don't know if you're there, uh, so you can share with us some thoughts, final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It was very interesting. Uh, very, very interesting to review uh, all the really big crisis that we have in front of us in terms of the global. So we should, we should that help us to, to take perspective. No, we are not the only ones having problems in the world. As a matter of fact, uh, we are having maybe less problems than most, most countries in the world. So thank you very much for that perspective. And thank you very much for all the, let's say the different, the, the approach that you have to, uh, let's say, enhance uh, the leadership uh, uh, abilities in, in, in Mexico. Uh, let me try to address our constituency in Spanish, please. Creo yo que lo que Michael nos dice es de que las soluciones están Eh, que sabemos qué es lo que tenemos que hacer, pero alguien tiene que hacerse cargo ¿verdad? y movilizar, movilizar es la palabra. Creo que ya pasamos del punto en donde debemos de preguntar qué hacer. La ley tiene bien claro qué hacer. Tiene una propuesta bastante, bastante analizada, completa, eh, sustanciada, Eh, factible de realizar, ¿verdad? ortodoxa, práctica, pero nos hace falta venderla, nos hace falta esa compelling story que habla Michael, de, de visualizar este país como un país próspero y visualizarlo nosotros en ese país próspero de alto crecimiento. Y, la, y no lo hemos podido hacer porque nos, nos ha faltado la capacidad de liderar, nos ha faltado la capacidad de movilizar Eh, efectivamente, eh, lo que hemos hecho es, eh, es alentador porque la NEI a, a, tiene una presencia, tiene una imagen que, hasta, que está mejorando, eh, tiene más eh, capacidades eh, y habilidades ejecutivas que como esta plática, por ejemplo, y las otras anteriores que hemos hecho, pero nos falta más movilización. Y la pregunta aquí es cómo debemos de movilizarnos. Y más que, de, que sugerirle a otros cómo hacerlo, más bien es qué puedo hacer yo para ayudar a que la ley se movilice mejor. ¿Qué tengo que aportar? ¿Qué puedo dar? ¿Qué es lo que no estoy haciendo? ¿Qué debo hacer? ¿Qué es lo que estoy haciendo y que no ayuda, sino al contrario, que estorba? Creo que ese es el punto principal, no, no preguntar estar preguntando qué hacer. Lo que Michael dice es muy cierto. Nosotros somos mexicanos, estamos aquí, sabemos qué hacer. De hecho, ese es el resultado de una clase, de un semestre en Harvard, eh, analizando por qué unos países tienen éxito y otros no. Y la respuesta es vayan a su país, analicen el país, estudienlo eh, y propongan soluciones que sean adecuadas a las personas que tienen las soluciones en manos, en este caso los empresarios. Entonces, la pregunta aquí es cómo movilizarnos, cómo puedo yo ayudar. Y, and, and again, I, I would like to thank Michael. It was a very interesting and stimulating uh, talk. And um, uh, we congratulate you for all your job and for all your 12 or more books that you have written. And uh, we expect you to Mexico. You have your friends here. You have your home here. Of course, you are welcome at my home here in Monterrey. And also you are welcome at a, at a, a penthouse that I have in Puerto Vallarta, which is a, a very nice resort. I don't know if you are married or not, your family or not, but you are welcome with all your family. Thank you very much again. I have, uh, I have uh, two kids and you will be pleased that the name of my elder daughter her name is Maria Elena, so I'm sure this is a fun, famous name, famous name uh, in uh, in Mexico. Listen, bring them, um, bring them, bring it with you, and then I will, enjoy I will, very much here. I will, I will. Uh, Fernando, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I cherish so much the relationship that we have. You are a very elegant, graceful, you know, intellectual entrepreneur uh, and uh, a global thinker that I always respected, so I'm happy that we maintain this friendship. 
Um, thank you so much, my regards to your family. And I promise you that Mexico has always been on my list and I will come um, soon and enjoy your uh, company face to face. Samuel, thank you so much for facilitating this. Uh, what I have uh, tried to do is to remind you of the key uh, fundamentals that you already know about. Because as I said, it's not about just knowing, it's about putting your understanding, your knowledge into action. Only action will make things happen. Consciousness is super important, but consciousness does, does not translate into action, nothing will happen. So that's why I chose deliberately to remind you and, and emphasize some of the key points that you already know, and to stress on the issues of uh, leadership, because that is what is missing. You guys have all the fundamentals and you have so many assets to make it big time, big time. And all your problems are solvable if they are approached with the right uh, leadership mentality. That's why I focused on the practical side so that we make this all to send you a message that this can happen and there are ways of happening and it's possible that you guys uh, make it happen. I wish Mexico uh, all the luck and success. You are a blessed country. Uh, you have contributed so much to humanity through culture and through music and through food and through so many different aspects that has enriched humanity. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person. And uh, please let me know if I can be of any kind of assistant, assistance to you and your organization of help. For me, uh, we come from the Middle East. We are warm blooded people and we have an emotional heart. So we make friends and we hug and, you know, we're warm people and you guys are the same. So I look forward that we come, I come there and uh, we established uh, a deeper friendship. Thank you. Thank you very much.